Mom Who Knows Nada. My name is Brianna, and this is the Mama Knows Nada podcast. Today, I have an old dear friend who has, is joining me from Ohio. Um, we actually went to the same high school together, which is kind of bizarre. And we still reconnect every once in a while, and she delivered her little girl, Faye, pregnant during half of the pandemic. And then your daughter's like, what, six months now? Six months, yeah. Ooh. So what was that like? Did you have to do anything different or was there crazy rules at the hospital or tell us about your experience being pregnant and delivering during COVID? Yeah. So, um, pregnancy wise, honestly, the best way to describe it is all those normal kind of fun things you do when you're pregnant, such as having a baby shower or, you know, taking a class in person, uh, you know, to prepare you for this massive event. Um, most of that was not happening. So, uh, that was a little tough, right? You know, mm. threw myself a pity party a couple times being like, <laughs> I wish I could do all these cool, fun things that pregnant people do when they're excited to have their first baby, and it just wasn't happening. Hmm. Um, so definitely sad at times, but uh, we made the best of it. So learning how to do some virtual events um, was a little fun. Uh, and um, ultimately just spending a lot of quality time with my hubby and just trying to, you know, get those last moments in together um, before our life completely changed yeah uh, for real. which yeah a lot of your listeners probably know too well mm. um hospital wise though uh you know obviously getting COVID tested before you go um Fun. make sure you're you know not sick when you come in um they did ask us to wear masks as much as possible so you know, while I was pushing and kind of doing all that, I was like, fuck this. Like, I am not wearing a mask. <laughs> like, I'm, I've been in this room for, you know, 24 hours at this point. If there's COVID in the air, you guys are going to get it. So it really doesn't matter. Um, uh, my husband was a little bit more cautious. And so he pretty much wore his mask the whole time. Oh, that's nice of him. <laughs> yes. Um, and then obviously no visitors beyond, you know, your immediate partner. So uh, that was a little hard, you know, it's kind of nice to share that moment with your closest yeah. family and your in-laws and stuff and to have them there. So that, that sucked a little bit. Um, but then at the same time, you know, uninterrupted time with the baby. And once they come out, it's just you and your husband and you're having that moment um, to yourself. I think the suckiest thing about this giving birth during a pandemic is because there was concern about, um, you know, cross contamination essentially mm. between different moms, uh, and babies, the nursery was closed. Oh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so, um, you know, you just went through this massive, you know, like experience, physical experience as a mom and the nursery can be kind of a godsend, right? Like mm -hmm. you can send your baby for a couple hours so you can get some solid sleep and recover. Nope. That baby is in that room with you from the go. Um, <laughs> that, does suck. that does suck. Yeah. So that probably sucked the most. Um, and then ultimately we just ended up making the decision to leave. We literally got like left the hospital 24 hours after she was born because we were like, if there's no other benefit of being here, like we might as well be home and you know, comfort of our own bed and yeah. all that. So we left, uh, really quickly, like as quickly as we could, um, just because it wasn't comfortable. Um, at that well, point. That's, so that's, yeah. That's kind of nice, like, to leave because I'll tell you what, I stayed in the hospital for three days mm -hmm. and man, those nurses, I know they're there to help you, oh. but Jesus, Mary and Joseph, like, they just don't go away. And no. then, and then, and so Declan would only sleep when he was in the nursery, like, to your point. Mm -hmm. And every, like, three or four hours, like, you got to feed him. And I'm like, can I just sleep? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You know, so you're like, I feel like I just got hit by a Mack truck and I need, I need some fucking sleep. Like, please. Get this thing. Now, did, did the nurses at your hospital, so I gave birth in Dallas and so every hospital has different like policies and protocols that they like help you with like breastfeeding or like formula or like, mm -hmm. did, cause I had like all kinds of hands all over me and, <laughs> and it wasn't fun. It wasn't fun, but it, I found that helpful. Did you have like a similar experience or was it, is it different for where you were? 
Um, yeah, so we, the main, I guess, kind of support were the nurse. So first of all, my like maternity nurse that I had during the actual delivery, I will never forget her name. Her name is Rachel. And she was like literally sent from God himself. Like I, <laughs> I could not, I don't know if it was like the hormones or what, mm -hmm. um, but she was just absolutely fantastic like was there was so supportive like walking me through every step of the way um i literally don't know if i could have given birth without her like she was just fantastic that. um so shout, shout out, out to rachel yeah i don't okay. even know if she was gonna see this but rachel you rock um and beyond that like the lactation consultants were there they came in a couple times um honestly they didn't really do much like they kind of came in and like checked to make sure the baby was latching and you know baby girl was a pro like she just came out and latched nice. great initially i got really lucky um right, so they then. were like yeah they were like she's latching great like we don't really like are, are you having any pain are you having any issues and at the time i was like no um so it was kind of quick in and out and that was it. Like it was the lactation part was like pretty low key. Um, I can imagine if we were having like latching issues or something like that, they maybe would have been coming in and having more mm. of a conversation with them. But um, yeah. And then just the constant, like what you were talking about 30 minutes, every 45 minutes, like someone coming in, like, you know, we're going to clean the bathroom. We're going to empty the trash. We're going to, you know, like do your blood work. We're going to, check your JJ. we're gonna do all these things oh yeah <laughs> oh my god so they let you leave after 24 hours because i had to like i think i had to have a bowel movement or something before i could go oh my I, god free <laughs> no one talks about the bowel movement after baby did you feel it, like everything was gonna come out so I, oh my God. Okay, so. This was not on the list of questions, but here we are. No, but this is actually very fitting. So I ended up having a complication related to constipation and I ended up back in the ER four days after delivery. So I do want to talk about this because this is one thing that I feel like no one talks about to prep for. Um, so first of all, they let me God. go. They, they asked me, I didn't have to have a bowel movement, but they asked me, oh, can you pass gas? And I was like, well, yes. And they're like, okay, then you're good. I was not good. <laughs> like, so I ended up, uh, so here's the lesson, ladies. Take Miralax, take a lot of Miralax. Bring it with you to, in your hospital bag. If they won't give it to you at the hospital, like, Oh gosh. It will save your life. So I um, ended up back in the ER and needed to get like professional uh -huh. help to get things moving because oh I had, so oh, it was awful. It was awful. Uh, see, they gave me stool softeners too, but not like legit laxatives, but like mm -hmm. stool softeners. But still like, oh, it's rough. I mean, I felt like, I don't think I felt mine as that as intensely as other women do, mm -hmm. but I definitely was not as backed up as you were. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, it's not funny because I can imagine that pain, but it's just like, holy shit, you know, like really, holy shit. <laughs> yeah, literally, holy shit. Like, I want I'm so gonna get. Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to get real about that because that is the one thing I've been texting my girlfriends who are pregnant right now is I'm like, just preemptively do it because you will love yourself so much more after that you took care of yeah. that. And if it's not a problem, great. But if it could have been, you prevented it. So. Right. And the other thing too is you're already in a diaper, like postpartum anyway. So if you shit your pants, it's no big deal. <laughs> like, yeah. You're covered. It's cool. You know, you got yeah. the pad sickles in there. I don't know if you made those, but I found those to be like oh, yeah. a godsend. Um, and I mean, you already got that shit in there. So if you really mm -hmm. need to go and it's diarrhea because you took too many laxatives, like it's cool. You're already yep. changing their diaper. Why not mm -hmm. <laughs> your own? Whatever. Yep. <laughs> giving birth removes all forms of shame just no shame about anything related to any of that stuff just 
do what you gotta do. I, this is like probably TMI for everybody, but I have never had so many different sets of hands in my vagina than trying to deliver my son. And I definitely had to be vacuumed out. Um, and I was like, I can't, and cause I, I, I'm in a similar, I, was a, blah, 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 I cannot speak. Um, I was in a similar situation where I didn't have any support other than my partner, really. Like we were in mm-hmm. Dallas, whatever. And so I was like, I can't have a C-section because how am I going to drop? My husband didn't have his license at the time. So I was like, how am I going to get to the doctor's appointments? How am I going to get this baby around if I can't lift 30 pounds? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So anyway, um, so I was like, no, I was like, you got this baby out and he was like stuck on my bone and his cord was wrapped around and stuck, all that fun crap. And so then you have like, all right, well, let's test for this. And that's, that's one hand. And then there's another physician assistant and then the nurse is in there and you're like, wow. In any other situation, I would be considered a slut, but because yeah. I'm giving birth, everybody put your hands on me. Cool. Mm-hmm. Huh. Yep. Anyway, that no was shame. <laughs> you're just like okay yeah <laughs> who's next <laughs> right like and you know what it makes oh, me God. think of it makes me think of like when you go to like a pool or something and in the bathroom there's like those older women who are just like buck naked and just don't care yeah. i'm like that's me now like i do not give a shit like we all have the same part you know like you it's like once all that has been seen by so many people you're like i don't care <laughs> Who needs modesty? Who needs modesty? <laughs> yeah. Now, how have you, now with all, okay, so hospital, pandemic, constipation, um, how have you, after all this stuff has simmered down, how's the transition to motherhood been for you and as a family of three now? Yeah, so the, for the real, real, like the first eight weeks were probably the hardest mm. thing I've ever gone through in my life. Um, it is just such a massive change, um, Mm -hmm. on so many levels, um, you know, from, you know, hormones to recovering from the birth itself, which I feel like a lot of people don't talk about either. Um, you know, and how that really is. And I, I, you know, um, the first, the first eight weeks were, were really rough, but then I think the turning point is, at least in our situation, is our daughter started sleeping through the night better, like around three-ish months or so, um, and then also when they start to smile, and so you can, oh, you yeah. get that, you get that, you know, um, you get that little bit back, which uh-huh. mentally is massive in terms uh-huh. of like, you're not taking care of this blob who just eats and poops and like cries and doesn't, you know, show you any, any sort of like yeah. reciprocity at all. Um, they're kind of needy little things, you know? Yeah. So like that part is rough, but then once you kind of get past that, at least for us, um, the last three months now that she's six months old have just been completely different, um, from the first three months. And I mean, I'm just like in love with her more each day, like seeing her develop and her personality grow. And, um, now I'm in a much better place than I was initially. Um, and I think too, it's a lot of like my hormones are leveling out. Um, You know, I think, uh, I've been doing a lot of research about postpartum, um, just experiences. And I think Mm -hmm. there's a lot talked about with postpartum depression, but not a lot is talked about, um, regarding postpartum anxiety. Mm. And, um, yeah, that hit me like a wall of bricks. My anxiety was just like through the roof. I was snapping at my husband. I was, you know, I was like looking at myself from the outside and I'm like, this is not who I am. Like, this is not like my natural state. And it was Uh all anxiety driven. And I'm now I'm feeling like that's less the case because I'm, you know, getting further and further away from the actual birth. Um, so yeah, now I'm in a much better place than I was three months ago, but it was, it was hard initially. And it, it does get better too. Like it's, um, birth is traumatic on a lot of levels like Mm -hmm. for the mom for the baby and and for dads it depending on how much they choose to witness or or look at like dominic wouldn't go below to see anything it's like i do not want to that that'll ruin everything for me it's like okay that's fine i don't care to hold my hand um but birth is there's so much happening and what i i 
Because I don't know about what you and Corey discuss in terms of the experience, because it's definitely different for moms and dads. And what I try to put it out for my husband is in a minute, in a split second, once you find out you're pregnant, you know, whether you're planning for it or hoping or praying or trying, or maybe it was hard, maybe it was easy. The main difference for like men and women are, is, is that like your mental, emotional, physical, spiritual being is changed in a split second. Mm -hmm. And then you end up carrying all of this stuff with you for 40 weeks or whenever you deliver some, sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more. And then you need to, you're handed a, a, a blob. Here you go. And if you're a first time mom like me, you're like, uh, now what? <laughs> now what? And then you layer that in with all the stuff that you didn't know you needed to know, or nobody told you, or you don't have a support system. And now you're like, huh? Mm -hmm. And now you're trying to recover. And I read something the other day and I love it. It was like, you know, celebrate the, the mom because she's being born too. Mm -hmm. And I think that really resonated with me because you are, this is a, this is something you've never done before. This is a role that maybe you didn't want, or maybe you wished for, or, but, and it's all about, it all comes into like our experiences, right? But it's a big change. Like not only is this organism born that depends on you for everything, <laughs> you have to figure it out. Like now you, now you're really an adult. Like a, you're like adulting at another level because now this thing depends on you like for everything. And it's just, it's a lot. And it's so much change so fast. Like even though it's nine months or 40 weeks, if that's still longer than most of my relationships, like <laughs> anyway, that's my, that's my, so to your point, the anxiety thing, I actually started seeing a therapist before Declan was born because I was like. I don't know if my head's going to stay screwed on straight. Mm -hmm. And then you read all these things and then you start like, it's so it's overwhelming. So I mm -hmm. think it's good that you're bringing that up because it's not just depression and baby blues. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and the other thing is like that can hit you at any time. You don't know when it's going to manifest. Like you might be fine for the first three months and then bam, like you get yep. smacked in the face. Like what you're talking about, like, holy shit. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. Anyway. Mm -hmm. That's all I got. Yeah. Well, <laughs> to that to that point too, I think most women also don't know that postpartum is also something that uh, postpartum emotional uh, or mental changes really mm -hmm. can happen through twelve months following delivery. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think a lot of people associate it with just like kind of that immediate, you know, four, eight, twelve, maybe oh, yeah. fifteen weeks. And that's just not true. Um, it's not true at all. And, um, you know, your body truly isn't physically even recovered for a year. So that's, that's an excellent point, right? It's, and I, you know, excellent. I think people just don't talk about that. And I think also in this country, we don't foster like having that kind of recovery time and, and adjustment mm. time period because everything's associated with, and, and for those listening, I'm, I work in HR. And so I'm very familiar with kind of the leave support that's available or not available from by companies. And, you know, we in this country have tied everything to this three month, 12 week time period, because that's what FMLA, the Family Medical Leave Act has has deemed like a time period that we can use for support but in reality like from a medical standpoint and a psychological standpoint and a family standpoint mm -hmm. you know we should be looking at our european neighbors who give minimum you know six months to a year for moms to be off fully paid in some countries um for that adjustment period and fathers to even be off for three six months um paid as well and we are just behind, we are just not in this country. We just don't recognize that. And it's unfortunate. I, yeah, I would definitely second that. I mean, and to, to your point, I think Declan was born on a Tuesday and Dominic was on a business trip the following Monday. So like a week later, like six days later, but, and he, you know, there was no leave. And so my husband's British, so he's used to 
six weeks of vacation time mm-hmm. generally. And I think his company offers in the UK like two or three weeks of paternity leave, but not in the US. Mm-hmm. So you're like, cool, here I am by myself mm-hmm. in a state with like two friends yep. with the baby. So yeah. on that mm-hmm. note, <laughs> now your support network is very frayed. Um, you're living in Ohio, but your family's all East Pennsylvania and Maryland. And a, a big, a big force in your life is missing. You, you lost your mom t- like 10 years ago, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, and so now here you are as a mom, what is that like? What is, <laughs> that's a, that's a loaded, very open-ended question. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, I've kind of started saying this phrase like, um, uh, grief regression that I feel mm-hmm. like, um, at once I found out I was pregnant and especially more now that, you know, Faye is here and we're, I'm mothering on a daily basis is it's a daily reminder that my own mom is not here. Um, and so that I didn't expect that really to happen. Like I have in the last 10 years, you know, you have waves that, that, that of life that kind of come and hit you where you're like, Oh crap. Like I, you like suddenly remember that that person's not there, whether it's Mm -hmm. a mom or a dad or a cousin or a friend or whoever. Um, but in this instance, because motherhood is so, you know, directly tied to our tribal, like evolutionary yeah. being as humans, um, it, it really smacks you in the face. And so, um, you know, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Like it sucks. It totally sucks. Um, and you know, I have great women in my life that have been super supportive and helpful. Um, but you know, again, not to sugarcoat it, it's not my own mom mm-hmm. and it's just not the same. So I try and be as conscious as I can to those feelings, let myself feel those feelings when I have them because it's completely healthy and normal. Totally. Um, Lean on my husband. I talk it out when I need to. Um, Oh, that's And yeah, and I do have a counselor that I call on and and talk to as a third party when I'm just having those moments where I'm like, shit, like I am not managing this well. It's overwhelming. It's taking my breath away. I need to just kind of like talk to someone neutral who can help me get through this moment right now. Yeah. Um, and that's been, that's been really helpful for me. Oh, that, I mean, my heart hurts for you. Like we've talked a little bit, like I was estranged from my mom for like 10 years and only reconnected right before, I mean, I'm 35 now. So right before my 30th birthday. And it wasn't really until Declan's existence, like that we became closer. Mm-hmm. Um, and she is a wonderful grandmother. I will never say otherwise that my son loves her so much, mm-hmm. but there's still like a, a disconnect in certain parameters because, you know, what our moms did when we were babies back in the eighties is so different than now and what's available, you know? And so my mom is, you know, she's a great, wonderful grandmother, but she's old school in a lot of ways, you know? And I mean, it's nice to have her support. I can't imagine, um, just not having, you know, somebody like, cause we, when we move to Florida, we don't know anybody. So she's come down a couple of times just to give us a weekend off, you know, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, during a pandemic. So it's such a blessing. And, you know, f- for me looking at that kind of relationship and, um, Dominic's parents are in the UK. They haven't seen Declan for two years. So, you know, there's, it's not a, cho- a chosen estrangement, but it is what it is. And then there you are in Ohio in a pandemic going, how the fuck do I do this? Like, where's my mom? Like, how, so how do you, how do you like kind of pull her into your life and make sure that she like Faye will know her grandmother? Yeah. So I actually, you know, I was thinking about this question before doing this today and, and I, it actually made me smile, like thinking about some of the things that consciously or subconsciously like you do. Mm-hmm. Um, so a couple good examples that I can give. So one is, um, in, in my mom's situation, she was an artistic type. And so she made these like really cool, 
um, pressed flower like frames that she would watercolor the background and like put the flowers on and then so write cute. like the name of the flower underneath and she taught herself calligraphy and um, wow. so I was able to get one of those nice frames from my dad and um, you know we put it into her into Faye's nursery so she's like she's th Aww. physically there and there and Faye can Aww. look at it and as she gets older you know we can t like go through it and tell her about it and all that stuff which is great um, another thing is my mom was really into gardening and had a green thumb and, um, <laughs> Corey and I are the same way. We, we have Aww. built this beautiful vegetable garden in our backyard and during the summer that is like our pride and joy. We are just obsessed with it. Um, and we love, love to that. cook. So, you know, taking in your own veggies and like making a fresh salad or whatever, um, you know, it's like, we just love that. So this summer i'm really excited now that she's going to be you know around nine months old that we're going to bring her outside and we're going to get her dirty and we're going to you know yeah, get her involved dirt. yes in the gardening um and i think that's going to be something that she'll look back fondly on and you know as she gets older we'll tell her you know well your grandmother was really into this and then hopefully that's a skill that she can bring with her yeah. you know through life which i think um would be really fun and then the the last Last example is, um, you know, we're really limited right now in the pandemic in terms of activities you want to do with your child, right? Like, mm -hmm. you're kind of trying to think of things that, you know, are safe and, and whatever. Um, and so we uh, were really running low on, like, baby appropriate books that we liked. Um, you know, we had books that a lot of people had gifted us, but a lot of them were, you know, for kind of the next phase, like, you know, mm -hmm. lots of text and all that kind of stuff, which is, which is great. And we'll use them later on. But for right now, like they just weren't really working for us. So we spent an afternoon where we went to a local bookstore. Um, and you know, we literally baby wore Faye, like put her on our front. And then she, <laughs> we spent like an hour and a half at the store and she was helping us pick out new books for her. Oh, that's so cute. Um, which, you know, she's six months old, so she's, she's touching everything and engaging, but it was so much fun. Um, and we got a bunch of new books that we we're super excited to use. And oh. one of the books, um, really reminded me of my mom, just like some of the stuff that was in it and the illustrations and, um, you know, I made sure to buy that book. And so now every time we read that book together, it makes me think of her. And mm -hmm. once, you know, she is old enough and can speak and understand us more, you know, we'll talk a little bit about that and remind her when we read the book, like why mommy likes this book. And, you know, so I think those are some little things that we've done that, um, help keep her kind of front and center for us and for me. And how does like her absence influence like your your parenting style, you know, cause I feel like it's such a precious gift being a mom, you know, and then, ah, oh gosh, like I don't, there's like no politically correct way for me to say anything. Cause I don't know how to be anything but direct, but like, I guess what I'm trying to get to is like, how do you, how do you take what your mom did give you mm -hmm. and, um, and kind of like before she passed on and, and kind of like repurpose that for Faye. Like what, what lessons has she given you that you can already see yourself doing for your daughter or, um, like maybe this behaviors that, or things that she would say, I catch myself saying stuff. My mom always said, and I'm like, Oh my God, you know? So I don't know if you've ever had like any of those mo moments or already, I mean, phase six months, but I don't know if any yeah. of those things resonate. Yeah, um, you know, my mom was always someone who liked to have a lot of fun and laugh and just kind of, I don't know, make light of maybe a crappy situation or something <laughs> that like wasn't very enjoyable. And so I yeah. try and now that we've kind of gotten out of the the woes of like the first three months and just being constantly on edge and the postpartum anxiety and all that and doing better and like being in a better place now. I find myself being really conscious of, you know, when there is like a big mess that the baby makes or whatever to just be like, well, cool. We're just going to take a bath and like, <laughs> or, you know, like we're starting to, we're, we're starting to feed her solids. And it's like, you know, initially my husband and I were being very conscious of like wiping her down while yeah. she's eating. And you know, the other day she just like stuck her hands right in the food bowl. And I was like, you know what, girlfriend, 
have fun. Like paint, paint yourself with the food. <laughs> Just, you know, and so we, like, turn on music and just start dancing with her while she's eating and just having fun. And, like, oh, that's so cute. I think that is totally something my mom, you know, would do when we were growing yeah. up. Um, but ultimately, like, the biggest thing I think I take away from just losing my mom at such a young age is it's a huge motivator. Um, yeah. It's just a big motivator to want to have a good life and, you know... Wow make the most of my life and make the most of Faye's life. And, you know, my mom is a very humble person. And so I know I'm going to fuck up. I know I'm going to do things that I, like, I am not going to be proud of or make mistakes. Um, and I think she left me with a lot of lessons to just be okay with that. And as long as you learn yeah. from them and you grow and you make the best of it, like that's all you can do. Yeah. That's powerful. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, it's a gift that it's a gift that you can, take such a profound and emotional situation and find the good in it you know like it's mm -hmm. I don't know if, if I could be that you know I don't know if I could do what you're doing you know <laughs> it's 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 uh whew. motherhood is so hard and I can only imagine some of the heartstrings that get pulled for you mm -hmm. during this process especially you know right after postpartum it's like that's a very sensitive time, you know, and ah, uh, I don't know. I just think what you're saying is powerful. Like, good for you for taking the best of her and making it yours, you know? Yeah. Oh, and you know, between all those things, just lots of tears. Lots of tears. <laughs> <laughs> oh, like, yes. All the tears. Yeah. It's just, I mean, the crying is therapeutic, and you just need to do it sometimes. So, so you know what? That's that's it's awesome that you say that because sometimes I look at crying. I cry a lot. I've always been a hyper emotional, sensitive person. And I look at like tears as like the physical, like the physical emotions, just getting out of you, yes. you know, like you're just, I gotta, I gotta feel your feels. I have a friend who always just say that, feel your feels. Yep. And you're like, okay, there it goes. There it goes. Mm -hmm. It's just literally rolling through me. And you know, I've saw, I was seen an acupuncturist and she said that to me the other day. She's like, everything is an experience. You just got to let it move through you. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Huh, that's pretty fucking good. <laughs> you know? yeah. I can get behind that. Like it was mm -hmm. awesome. Mm -hmm. Is there anything that you find particularly like fearful or like nerve wracking when it comes to motherhood? So going back to talking about, you know, living in a geographical location where we're not near, you know, a, um. a family support system. I think what runs through the back of my mind every day is if there, you know, becomes a time where, so, so two things. Um, I am very fearful of burnout. Mm. Like I ha I'm just like constantly thinking about, you know, am I ever going to reach a point where I just cannot do it or I can't take it and I need you know I need two days where I can go and like be on my own and sleep in until 11 o'clock in the morning because I need to just recharge um you know and so I'm I'm fearful of burnout um I don't feel that way right now but I'm like anticipating it and feeling like mm. it could become something because it does happen we're human uh -huh. um and then with the burnout, I'm just fearful of if and when burnout happens, um, you know, without having that support system here, it makes me nervous to, to think about, you know, what that would be like or what that impact would be, you know, in my relationship with my partner. Because um, mm. I think that mm. I am more at risk of that happening than he is just because of his, you know, personality. And, and like let's be real, the like worry and concern about the child is mainly mentally on the mom. Like, let's be honest, like the mental, I call it the mental load. Like the mental load is on me. I feel like I put it on myself more mm -hmm. than my husband does. And I don't know if that's just like a maternal thing or what. So the mental load is, I'm just worried that sometimes the mental load is going to be too big. And when I need a break, Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not going to have the support that I need to have a real break. Yeah. I like that you say that because I get in fights with Dominic about this all the time because 
he goes on a trip and I still pack half the bag, you know, like I still make sure go through the checklist. Do you have this? Do you have that? Do you have this? Yep. And he's like, I can do it. And I'm like, but you didn't. So is it going to get done? Oh my <laughs> you know? gosh. And, yes. and, I, and I, I mean, my husband is really great. He's a wonderful, wonderful father, mm -hmm. but he has this analogy and you might like this where he's like, I have too many books on my shelf. And, and I say, well, those books are on the floor. Someone has to pick them up. It can't always be me. I can't mm -hmm. always be the one l literally mentally and figuratively picking up the books to put them back mm -hmm. on the shelf where they belong. Like, mm -hmm. and you, you know, there's definitely, it's gotten to a point now where if he like, he made oatmeal the other day, he's going to kill me when he <laughs> listens to this. And I was just like, I got so annoyed because I'm making dinner, cleaning up dinner, cleaning up breakfast, mm -hmm. da, 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 you know, all the things. And I just left it on the on the stove for like two days because I was like, I'm not fucking cleaning up that goddamn oatmeal pot. Like he can do it, you know? And it's really a passive aggressive kind of thing, mm -hmm. but it's like, I see it mm -hmm. and he doesn't even see the mess that he made. Nope. And he leaves it there for like, you know, mm -hmm. me to do. And I'm like, if I did that, if I did that, we should just burn the house down. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you did that, the house would look like it was, you know, a hoarder's paradise or whatever. Like nothing would get taken care of. And you have animals too, right? So there's like mm -hmm. the pet hair and like, yep. I don't know if your dog shed, we have a big old mess of a mutt and he sh and the cat. And like, you're just like, I I I we agreed to have a clean house. Mm -hmm. Sure. We can have a cleaning lady, but that doesn't mean we can't we still got to maintain, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like she might mm -hmm. scrub the toilets, but could, could you vacuum, you know, right. the crumbs from the pancake catastrophe that you created this morning? Thanks. Yes. Yep. So yeah, uh, we, and I do think to, to like your point, I think there's just something in a woman's brain. This is why I really feel like we need a woman president because our ability to multitask, mm -hmm. generally speaking, and our ability to think about things in in what this this like methodology that we have as women is just incredible. And I don't know, no offense, men. I'm not trying to trash talk dads or or. Mm -hmm. or I just think that there's a certain mental space that women have mm -hmm. that men just don't, mm -hmm. and it's frustrating. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to your point, it is. It is. It is really frustrating. Um, <laughs> And I think, you know, we owe it to ourselves to build out tools that help uh -huh, uh -huh. to manage that. Because if, like, at least the way that I was feeling initially was that, you know, I was like, this is how it's always going to be. And I'm always going to be the one kind of taking the brunt of managing the children in addition to managing myself. And my partner mm. is mainly going to be focused on just managing himself. And that's just not fair. Um and it wasn't intentional. Like, like Corey's a fantastic dad and is very involved and, and helpful. Um, but in terms of kind of maintaining the house and maintaining, you know, like making sure there's enough diapers and there's enough wipes and all uh -huh. of these things, it's like, I don't think he yeah. was paying attention to that. Like, he'd be like, oh, yeah, let's just go into our reserve pack that's in the to-go bag and then be like, oh, wait, we're all out of wipes and the baby's sitting there with, like, a poopy butt. And it's like, no, like... <laughs> Not okay. <laughs> um, I hear so, you. I um, hear you. So, yeah, I, I have actually some tips and recommendations about managing that that have actually helped Corey and I a ton that I oh, love awesome. to talk about. Go for it. Yeah. So, um, in like ha one of my anxiety filled moments, I connected with my counselor and was just like telling her that I was just on edge all the time. And I was like, I need help. Like, how do I, how do I make this better? Cause I don't like feeling this way. Yeah. Um, and so I talked a, a bit about that kind of mental load of feeling that I'm responsible for, you know, making sure like essentially what I explained to her is I said that from the second I wake up, I am anxiety riddled. Like, if I wake up 20 minutes later, if I, or so, let's say this, if I get out of bed 20 minutes later than I want to, and I feel like I can't really take a good shower, that just sets the tone for like the rest of the day. Cause then I feel like I'm behind. I didn't have the time, mm -hmm. you know, now I, how do I, sh do I even shower today? Um, you know, like, okay, crap. I need to make sure I brush my teeth. Like 
it just it just made it awful. Um, and so one of the things she recommended was having a conversation with my with my husband about delineating morning responsibilities so that we know who was actually going to do what. Um, yeah. Which we never did. Like it was like we knew what needed to happen, but every morning, like we were kind of whoever got to it first got to it first. So, like in my mind, though, I was thinking that I had to do everything. So, like, that just made me super anxious about the whole morning to make sure stuff got done. So, what we did is we sat down, we, like, talked about, okay, here are the five things that need to happen in the morning for the baby. And we split it up. And we identified roles and said, okay, in the mornings, you're going to do this. In the mornings, I'm going to do that. And since that was such a simple change, but since we had that conversation and did that, like, my anxiety level has dropped almost 100%. Like... Yeah, it was so simple. I don't know why we didn't do it before, um, but it ha really helps with that mental load, mom mental load piece. And so what I was able to do is those things that Corey said he was going to do, out of my mind. Like, I don't even worry about them anymore. Like, if they get messed up, he knows that he was responsible for them. I don't need to tell him anymore that they got messed up. Like, it's not on me. Um, That's but awesome. yeah, so that, that is like, it's so simple, but you can do that with every aspect of the baby planning, prepping, leaving the mm -hmm. house, taking care of like the, you know, to go bag, like who's going to be like everything, just identify who's responsible for it and split it up Stupid bag. Stupid bag. I don't miss that thing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, that's a great, that's great insight. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh man. I mean, Dominic and I do that now, but I also think that you and Corey had such a solid relationship, like going into it, you know, like you were together for several years, you got married and you were married for several years and I have Bay, And I think that too, like is another piece of the puzzle. Like I, cause I have, I think I had the same kind of like level of anxiety you're talking about, but in a totally different way. Mm. Um, and Dominic and I were only together for a year before Declan was born. I mean, that's like, and we we knew each other for a couple of years, but we weren't dating or in a relationship. So we're like, oh, fuck, like, ha, like five months in, we found out I was pregnant and you're like, Ugh. you know, and that totally changes the nature of your conversations and all the plans that you have. And now, so now, now we're at that point where he just does this and then I do that and it's like unspoken, mm -hmm. but it took us three years to get to where you guys are at six months, you know, <laughs> and that was not fun. Mm -hmm. That was a lot of me putting my head through a brick wall and yep. like saying what you're saying is just like, I can't do it all. Mm -hmm. I'm one person. Mm -hmm. <sighs> mm -hmm. And I still feel like I can't do it all. And our son's in preschool and I'm like, how do I stay on top of all this shit? <laughs> yeah. Well, and you probably would like know how this feels too is with the pandemic, right? Like a mm -hmm. lot of our work situations have changed. And so either both yeah. or one person is fully at home, um, mm -hmm. you know, full time or at periods of time. And so for me, I'm working remote a hundred percent of the time. My husband is going into his office um, so then there's also that mental load of, oh, because I'm the one that's at home, home. I need to be, you know, making yeah. sure that we know at least what we're going to make for dinner, if not like, you know, prepping it and whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, that's another thing that's like super stressful that it's like, no, I'm actually really busy and I don't necessarily, you know, I might be working up until five 30 when we need to go pick up the baby from daycare. And so I don't have time to be in the kitchen for 30 minutes. Like, yeah prepping stuff or heating stuff up or whatever. Making um, baby food. <laughs> yeah. So like, that's another thing is for anyone that's listening and kind of trying to figure out those roles, especially with one or both of you working from home, define it. And also just because someone is working from home does not mean that they are the automatic drop all this shit on them. That doesn't work either. So like heads up on that. Like, don't, don't let that yes. be the deciding factor for you. Yes, I I love that. Oh, that's a that's a really good like unsolicited advice. Do you have any more? <laughs> Honestly, the only other thing that I feel like I've talked about with a lot of my girlfriends is just the prep for like anticipating for the mom post birth, like what mm. 
to expect and what that's going to be like. I think the biggest thing that we did not anticipate is the level of just kind of like recovery that I physically needed. Mm -hmm. Um, So not to get like super gory or anything, but I did have a level two tear, um, which is, which is common. You know, a lot of women get it. Um, That shit is painful um, and very uncomfortable um, and it takes, yeah. you know, it takes a good couple weeks to really feel like you're not in constant discomfort all the time. Uh-huh. And so I think that, um, I wish I had known more about how to care for myself, um, with that level of kind of injury. I'm going to call it an injury. Um, and <laughs> I like it. yeah. And that my partner, my husband was going to be really on double duty, especially for the first two weeks. He was taking care of me from a recovery standpoint because I Mm -hmm. needed help. And he was also taking care of the baby. Um, and that was a lot on him. Like he just, it was, it was like, holy crap. Like I didn't realize I was going to need to care for two people that were like hardcore, like needed the recovery time. Um, so that's another piece of advice I would give is that, you know, having your partner or whoever your support system is, um, as the woman, like you are going to need time to recover and it's going to suck for a couple yeah. weeks. Um, and it's, it's rough, but if you anticipate it, you'll get through it and you'll be okay. But that I think we just didn't, we didn't know. And I think like on that vein, like hope for the best, prepare for the worst. Like, yes. You know, like get everything ready. I mean, I mean, again, with this back to the support thing, like I made all my own food for, you know, Mm -hmm. the lasagnas, the muffins. Like, I don't know if you have that same experience too, where like Mm -hmm. all the things, like your padsicles, I don't know if you made those and you just like put the aloe and the witch hazel and you freeze Mm -hmm. them, you know, Mm -hmm. like nobody did that for me. Like, uh, and uh, in my, in what I had in my corner was the ability to be professionally pregnant. Like I quit my job to be with my partner, um, and start fresh and, um, found that I was pregnant like 10 days later. So I had the ability (laughs) to just, you know, go to the yoga classes, which is something I would recommend to every woman, (laughs) Mm -hmm. but I had that capability to do all those things. But most women don't have that. Most women don't have, the ability just to be a professionally pregnant person and prep and research and go to appointments and go to classes. So I lucked out in that capacity, Mm -hmm. but thank God I lucked out in that capacity because otherwise I wouldn't have been able I wouldn't have had anything ready for what you're talking about, like post baby and, you know, having it burn when you pee for three weeks after delivery, because everything is sensitive and tender and, you know, you have to urinate just like, yeah, you, you need to have a shit, you know? Mm-hmm. So, wow. Yeah. Oh, uh, I mm-hmm. hear. Um, yeah. Just capitalizing on what you're saying there. It's, there's a lot of things you don't know you need to know. Right. And right. I, I think we could spend all day talking about more and more of them and they change mm-hmm. as like, I mean, is Faye crawling or, or moving yet? No, she's, she's still immobile. Good. Push her, push her down. Push her down. Push her back down. I mean, she'll get there, but make sure she's not crawling until she's at least one. Yeah. (laughs) Who cares about that? Um, Because then as they change, like everything changes and it's like, you get this great routine. Like you're talking about, gosh, she started sleeping through the night so early Mm -hmm. and I'm just jealous of that. You know, like took Declan a friggin' year. So. Ugh. Anyway. Yeah. I could go on a tangent about that, but I'm going to stop myself. <laughs> I'm going to stop myself. Um, what other, any other unsolicited information or insight you'd like to add, or maybe something about, um, how you sought su- like support or, um, helping maybe someone else who doesn't have a mom? Like, is there something you did in particular to like give yourself support where, you know, your mom, you know, could have been or anything along that vein? Um, so counseling, I would recommend, um, you know, whether you're, you've lost someone or not, um, going (laughs) through, you know, going through, um, the whole birth experience is a major change. Um, and something that we all, you know, need support, you know, I'll say it again, 
the biggest thing that overarching that just hit me out of this whole experience is how we are not designed as humans to do this alone. Like we are Mm. not, we're not meant to be on our own, um, in learning, especially the first time around and like learning how to do these things. Like we, we grew up in tribes where you had your cousins and your grandparents and your aunties and your uncles, you know, and all of these uh, women that were there to teach you how to nurse, to teach you how to breastfeed, to teach you, you know, these are not, we, I feel like society makes an assumption that just because you become a mom that you just will automatically learn and know how to do these things. No, like that's not how this is designed. Uh -uh. Um, so in that vein, asking for help, I know, you know, I'm a very independent person. It's hard to ask for help, ask for help. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we have been really lucky that we have a couple neighbors that live behind us that, um, have just been fantastic and offered to watch Faye a couple times for us so that Corey and I could just get out of the house just by ourselves. Um, and I, I tell her all the time, I was like, I, I just feel guilty. I feel guilty asking you. And she's like, she has two kid, two grown kids. And she's like reminding me all the time. She's like, Sophie. I love this. Like, I want to give this to you. And she knows that we don't have, you know, a huge support system here. And so I feel guilty every time. But at the same time, I'm like, this person's telling me that they want to offer help and support. And I need to take that for what it is. Yeah. Um, so, you know, with that said, if people offer help, take it. Mm -hmm. Um, counseling is huge. Whether you think you need to go or not, um, you'll get more value out of it than you realize. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and, you know, back to your point, feel your feels. Um, yeah. Get it out. Yeah. One (laughs) of the biggest things my counselor talks to me about all the time is as a society, we kind of always say to like, that we want to try this, try to find the silver lining or find something that we are grateful for in spite of. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you're going through such a major life change, that's fucking hard. Um, sometimes you don't find the silver lining and sometimes mm-hmm. you don't need to say, well, you know, like the biggest thing yeah. that pet peeve of mine is, oh, well, you're at least your baby's healthy and everything's fine. Yes, I very much am am grateful for that, but that doesn't dismiss or devalue the fact that I feel like I'm an anxiety mess ball right now Mm -hmm. or that I miss my mom or whatever. I feel those feels and those are completely valid. And so that's my biggest thing for moms is, especially new moms, is feel your feels. You are valued. Your feelings are valued. Feel Mm -hmm. them. And you do not need to find that silver lining or be grateful for anything in that moment. Just (laughs) feel how you feel. And I think the other thing to remember for, at least for me, is that you cannot take care of a person if you are not taking care of your person. Mm -hmm. Like you need to be good for that baby to be good. And Mm -hmm. sometimes that means taking a break and getting help or whatever it is. And I think those are really important things that it's easy to get weighed down in the scope of life and it's easy to have excuses. Oh yes. And it's so easy to put your kid first, but I I love this quote too, is if you don't take care of your wellness, you'll have to if you don't make time for your wellness, you'll you'll be forced to take time for your illness. Mm -hmm. And that can be a multitude of scopes from physical, emotional, mental, whatever, spiritual. And if you're not tr- at least giving yourself some kind of just care, not even self-care, just like if you're not taking care of yourself, you cannot be good to mm-hmm. another individual, especially your child who really needs you to be good for them. Yep. So I love all that. Thank you for sharing, especially with your mom. I know that can be a really difficult topic. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I mean, we've talked to you a little bit about, you know, loss and love so it's um it's not lost on me but i i think that people listening who might be in a similar situation will appreciate your vulnerability so thank you for sharing that with us yeah um well on that note i'm the mom who knows nada my name is brianna big thanks to sophie for joining us from ohio today (laughs) and uh sharing a little bit about her journey and little baby Faye at six months you can um Find me at mamanoznana.com and until next time, take care of yourself. Bye.